A week later, the man drank an essence fluid, and his friend asked him where he got the life essence fluid from. He arrogantly retorted, who else could it be? and replied that it was from Jie Sheng, because Jie Sheng had actually hidden vials in his other pair of worn-out shoes. His friend questioned if he had stolen from Jie Sheng and if he wasn't afraid of offending Jie Sheng. The man dismissively asked why he should fear Jie Sheng when Jie Sheng was just a lackey for the Ji Yu Gan, and even those vials were obtained by pandering to them. He also mentioned that their boss was from the Fan family, which meant they were not even in the same league, and dealing with Jie Sheng was just part of the mission given by the fans. He then threw the empty tube away, confidently stating that Jie Sheng was useless and cowardly because Jie Sheng hadn't dared to return to the dormitory after the last beating, and no one knew where he was now. He further told his friend that even if Jie Sheng acted up, his boss, Ji Yu, would still be easily controlled by their young master Shizai in the future. Since Jie Sheng hadn't even awakened yet, he feared he would beat him to death if they faced each other one on one. However, Wyan suggested he not underestimate Jie Sheng too much, leading him to ask Wyan if he regretted betraying Ji Yu after seeing Jie Sheng obtain so many vials of life essence, or if he wanted to grovel before them again. He then told Wyan that he had seen plenty of fence sitters like him but assured him he would come to his senses after a few beatings from him. Wyan simply told him to check the campus network and asked if he didn't know that today was the supernova selection. He replied that, of course, he knew because it was a big deal, after all, with the school having installed so many cameras on the field. Also, any student could watch it through the campus network, and he was planning on heading to the auditorium to watch on the big screen. Opening his phone, he saw that it had already started. He was amazed to see the host, and his friend told him that the host was the captain of the champion team during the last selection, and an absolute MVP. The lady, called Slaughter Rabbit, announced to everyone that since they had just introduced the most arrogant team, it was now time to introduce the top three teams with the best chances of winning. This made the man wonder what she meant by the most arrogant team and which team it was. Slaughter Rabbit then introduced the first of the top three teams, Team 23 Crimson Flames, and explained to everyone that the members of Crimson Flames were fire attribute transcenders. On top of being three-star ranked, they had a star chart cultivation rate of over 50%, making their team the highest in overall cultivation. Slaughter Rabbit also announced that the former captain, Zheng Yu, has an impressive 56% transcended genes rate. However, according to a reliable source, the captaincy of the strongest team has now shifted to the highly anticipated freshman, Fan Shizai, the heir of the Fan family. This change is understandable since, according to the given information, Shizai is already a three-star transcender with a star chart cultivation rate of 83% and a whopping 90% transcended genes amount. She then tells everyone that they should eagerly await Shizai's performance later. She then directed attention to the next team, announcing them as a team composed entirely of female warriors called the Rootbreakers. Their captain, Jan Ying, is currently recognized as the school's strongest student, possessing 85% transcended genes. Jan Ying, the senior sister of Extinction, cultivates the Myriad Sword Star chart, and her attribute is water. She was also infamous for shattering the pants of Team 23 Crimson Flames Captain Zhang Yu with a single slash. Turning her gaze to the next team, Slaughter Rabbit introduced the team captain named Xiao he, whose team is called the Shield and Sword. She shared with everyone that it is said the Shield and Sword possess the strongest sword below the 4-star rank and the strongest shield. Also, their fans in her live chat are saying they are the top contenders for the championship in this competition. Slaughter Rabbit then officially announced the start of the first round of the Supernova selection, stating the stage is set in a forest with a total of 16 teams. She outlined the rules, if a team captain loses their ability to combat, the team shall be deemed disqualified, and the remaining six teams will advance to the next round. The man's friends expressed awe at the top three teams' capabilities, pondering the prowess of the team described as the most arrogant. One friend then asked Wyan if he was correct in hearing that he had been watching the livestream from the beginning and how exactly the so-called most arrogant team had shown off. Wyan replied that they were a team of first-year students, with only four members and enough bravado to compete for the glory of Supernova against the second- and third-year students, which is why Slaughter Rabbit dubbed them the most arrogant small dogs. The man asked if Wyan was saying that all the members of that arrogant team were first-years and comprised only four people, to which Wyan replied yes, identifying it as the Zinkun team. This made the man shout, questioning how in the Nine Hells they even qualified. The man's friend replied that Ji Yu possesses a 95% transcended gene rate, so it's understandable that she could be the captain if she had encountered a breakthrough. However, he noted that Jie Sheng and Zayada were also on the team. The man exclaimed that it was impossible because all team members should at least be awakened, questioning if Jie Sheng had awakened and how he did it so suddenly. Then, the man shouted, asserting he didn't care because it had taken Jie Sheng two years to awaken. 
Yet, with only a 39% transcended gene rate, Jie Sheng was still at his mercy, noting that everyone is awakened these days. Wyan told him that although Jie Sheng does have a low amount of transcended genes and continued his studies for two years, that meant Jie Sheng had been there for two whole years, dedicating himself to the institute. Wyan asked the man if he was aware of the kind of courses offered at the institute, reminding him that Jie Sheng diligently pursued every course as if his life depended on it. Wyan also mentioned that there is something they might not know. All the students from the previous year, when they see Jie Sheng, address him as Brother Zhao. Meanwhile, in the forest, a second-year man named Ma Zio Long, captain of the Dark Horse Shooting Star Team, called Jie Sheng Brother Zhao and greeted him and Zio Dao, expressing his surprise at meeting them again in the supernova selection. Jie Sheng just smiled, and Zayato covered herself when they remembered them. Long asked if they still remembered the day they left school, reminding them that they beat up almost all of them. Long then told them that upon seeing their appearance there, every team from the 24th batch, as long as they weren't grouped with the third years, made their way to them, indicating they had awakened since they were participating. Long also mentioned that their team had taken on such an arrogant name and, after careful deliberation, they all agreed to settle the score with a beating in a one-on-one -on -one battle, asking if that was fair. Zinkan praised Jie Sheng, expressing his surprise at Jie Sheng attracting even more animosity than himself. He then faced the crowd, questioning if the gathered opponents were all they had managed to muster, implying it was insufficient, which infuriated Long who loudly demanded to know when it became Zinkun's turn to speak. Meanwhile, one of the professors questioned Bo Liang if he was truly confident in his freshman team's ability to advance through the first round. Considering the competition, especially pointing out the six teams composed entirely of second-year students, totaling 30 people, the professor wagered 100 vials of life essence fluids against Bo Liang's team making it through, prompting other professors to place their bets of 50, 188, 200, 250, and 300 vials, respectively. The professor then questioned Bo Liang's readiness to face the consequences, to which he affirmed positively. Curious, the professor inquired about the meaning behind the team's chosen name, remarking that discussing the end in such apocalyptic terms wasn't fashionable. Back in the forest, the students debated the implication of their team's name, Doomsday Starlight, questioning if it was meant to curse them or suggest they were the saviors in a world on the brink of ending. They accused the team of arrogance, echoing Slaughter Rabbit's label of them as the most arrogant small dogs. However, he simply smiled, contemplating the notion that Starlight kindles flames, and acknowledging that he alone couldn't save the world. He mused that before the apocalypse arrives, it's crucial to allow the sparks around him to ignite, which is why he needs to add some fuel to the starlight. He then dismissed the student's challenge for a one-on-one -on -one fight, stating that only by facing their adversaries together would they have a chance. This stance only served to make the second-year students even angrier. The students then called Zinkan an arrogant bastard and asked him if he expected them to gang up on him. Long and the others were shocked when Jie Sheng stepped forward and shouted to them that his big brother Zinkan had already spoken, so they should all just come at them. Jie Sheng then jumped towards them, telling them that since they hadn't seen each other in over a month, they should let him see what progress they all had made. Jie Sheng wrapped his leg behind Long's leg and extended both his hands, using his Iron Mountain Lean skill to make Long, who was shouting at him to listen, slam onto the ground. Jie Sheng then told them that they all should just come at them, and it didn't have to be like before because those times they could use their transcendent power. On the other hand, one of the professors tried to take his vials back from Bo Liang because he had changed his mind, but Bo Liang grabbed them and told him that it was too late. The professor then asked Bo Liang about Jie Sheng's background, and Bo Liang told them that they were probably only interested in news about transcendence powers and that if it were those martial arts teachers hired by the school, they wouldn't have bet against him. Jie Sheng is a student with only 39% transcended genes and was diligent in his studies, having continued them twice. Jie Sheng studied with zeal for those two years, and while he was unable to learn any transcendence powers, he became a genius in the eyes of their martial arts teachers, a prodigy. Jie Sheng was also enthusiastic about teaching others after mastering each move, so much so that almost all the students in that class have received Jie Sheng's guidance and even consider him a mentor. Jie Sheng is truly trusted by everyone there and before the semester ends. Since Jie Sheng doesn't know if he'd be able to return to the institute again, he gives the whole class a final lesson. However, except for those who completely abandoned close quarters combat, everyone got knocked out. The professor tells Bo Liang that at the end of the day, it was just physical combat, and compared to transcendence powers, it was like hitting a rock with an egg. Bo Liang tells the professor that Jie Sheng has awakened, but the professor arrogantly says that Jie Sheng awakened after two whole years and has too low potential. The professor then asks Bo Liang how capable anyone could be and, besides student Ji Yu, who won the genetic lottery, who else could even live up to their standard? 
Bo Liang, fixing his glasses with a finger, asks the professor in return if he should take it as another bet. The professor asked Bo Liang if he believed that winning against the second years now would secure their place in the next round. He then looked back at the screen while telling Bo Liang that as the world becomes more stable, the students are getting weaker with each passing year. He remarked that, except for the few naturally gifted, these students were all delicate flowers raised in a greenhouse and nothing but fuel for the strong. He was simply destroying them prematurely. Wang shouted to Jie Sheng that they were there to welcome him back and were also curious to see who was worthy of being called big brother by him. Yet, from what they had seen, it seemed he had followed a fool, his big brother provoking them to gang up on him. Long then activated his transcended genes, telling Jie Sheng that there is a limit to bravado, and that they were all just beginners who had recently transcended, which meant it was nothing but self-destruction. Long also shouted that since Zinkan had insisted, they would grant his wish and apologize to Jie Sheng because they would give him a crushing defeat. Long told Jie Sheng that after their defeat, he could take over the captain's position. He shouted to them that their stronger transcendence powers should easily crush them, but Jie Sheng simply called Long an idiot and stated that Xing Kun was much stronger than him. Jie Sheng was about to ask Long how he could possibly take over the captain's position when someone attacked Long. Slaughter Rabbit announced that Captain Ma Zio Long had been defeated and his Dark Horse Meteor team was now eliminated. The man laughingly shouted that those second-year rookies were cute and they went all out but were still so useless, and the captain was as fragile as a doll, too. The man then headed to the other second-year team and defeated Captain Zia Zio, which resulted in her flying high team being eliminated. A lady in Long's team shouted that the man's speed was too fast and they didn't have the ability to resist at all, asking if it was the third-year team who had started their mission training. Slaughter Rabbit then announced that the second year was completely crushed by the opponent, and that man was Chen Zia from the fourth grade, who uses wind-based transcendence power like her. Chen Zia then defeated Captain Liu Yin along with his monthly ticket team, and Captain Rong Yuzhu with her Let's Subscribe team. Following that, Chen Zia eliminated Captain Zion Yuwei and her five-star task force team. Turning his attention to Zinkan, Chen Zia shouted that it was their turn now and leaped towards him at high speed, proclaiming his love for dealing with rookies the most. Lying injured on the ground, Long told Zhao in disappointment that Zinkan was his chosen captain. Slaughter Rabbit announced that the arrogant small dogs, Team Doomsday Starlight, were now in danger. As Chen Zia neared to grab his face, Zinkan simply walked forward and easily dodged Chen Zia's hand, leaving Chen Zia confused. Zinkan then raised his fingers, and the metal underground rose up. The sharp metal then headed straight for Chen Zia, who couldn't believe that Zinkan's step was to inject his transcendence power into the ground. The metal struck Chen Zia's stomach, easily defeating him. Zinkan asked what the name of his move was again but decided to forget about it and dubbed his attack the Kidney Ringer Star Sword. Slaughter Rabbit shouted that Captain Zinkan wasn't defeated at all, and with Chen Zia losing consciousness, it meant Chen Zia had been defeated. Zinkan then called someone out, stating it was not he who needed practice, but his team members. He also commented that the second year seemed a bit weak, and they were just right. Slaughter Rabbit announced that the freshman team was really quite arrogant, and Zinkan challenged none other than one of the top three favorites to win, the Wind and Sand team. The captain of the Wind and Sand team came forward, shouting that Zinkan was arrogant for a first-year team member. Long couldn't believe that Zhao's choice for captain was so incredibly strong. The man then called his team, instructing them to work at top speed to eliminate those arrogant fools. Slaughter Rabbit informed the viewers that the combat philosophy of the Wind and Sand team was to ambush whenever there was an opportunity, and to gang up on an opponent whenever possible. He teasingly tells the enemy to come to them and be their little punching bag. Luo Yin thinks Zinkan is just asking for a beating, but Zinkan actually defeats Chen Zia. However, Luo Yin believes that it was all because Chen Zia was careless and kept on trash talking before making a move on Zinkan. Luo Yin heads towards him, while his team moves to the other side, thinking that Zinkan is definitely not simple and his sword condensation is incredibly fast. Also, Zinkan is able to see through the battle situation at a glance, accurately estimating the moment to attack Chen Zia. His battlefield experience seems to be even richer than those who have been through actual combat. But Liu Yin wonders how it was possible and if it was due to talent. Before Liu Yin reaches Zinkan, someone grabs his arm, and Jie Sheng tells him that it was they who needed the practice. Liu Yin tells Jie Sheng that he knows he is playing instructor for the next batch of students, but he is not one of those low-level rookies and asks if Jie Sheng thinks he can stop him. Liu Yin then uses his dragon skill to attack him, but Jie Sheng counters with his dragon too, which causes a strong explosion of magic power. Liu Yin asks him who gave him the courage to challenge him, someone who has cultivated the dragon star chart like Shang Guan Qi with his only 39% transcended genes, and tells him that no matter how he refines his dragon, it will only be a small insect compared to them. 
he summons his dragon again and shouts to Liu Yin that power is not about being bigger or longer. Liu Yin teasingly tells him to come at him, and he'll show him the despair and the disparity of power, but Liu Yin is shocked when he appears in front of him at speed and attacks. He then jumps back to his position while Liu Yin tells him that he uses his own blood to replace the water elements needed and has let his transcended genes refine his own blood. Liu Yin also tells him that the water dragon of his, which should have roamed outside, now lurks within his body to gain a stronger power advantage over others, but he is not joking around anymore. While that can make his dragon stronger, he will also lose any long-range combat power, and once that blood dragon is destroyed, he will also be severely injured at the same time. But he just replied that the clumsy bird flies first, the lame turtle travels a thousand miles, one person equals a hundred, and ten horses are as good as one weak horse, which means that the importance of perseverance and effort over innate talent or quantity. He then confidently shouts to Liu Yin that his genes are inferior, and that he must use his life to fight. On the other hand, in another part, the lady wrapped in vines tells Ziyadao that she has checked the list of the awakened for their batch, but her name wasn't on it, which means, at the time of enrollment, she hadn't awakened yet, and it's been less than two weeks since school started. The lady also tells Ziyadao that she has just awakened and already cultivated into a three-star transcendent, which is quite incredible, even though she has just started learning her star chart. The lady then asks how she managed to do it, and she replies that she gets emotional easily, remembering Zinkan telling them to answer like that if anyone asks them. The lady then tells her that she must be a cultivation prodigy, but it is a pity that her transcended genes don't exceed 50% and could only cultivate the vine star chart. The lady then raised huge vines while telling her that she'd remain a small fry even with her talent and never be able to step onto the stage. The sharp, huge vines then head in her direction, and she jumps away to dodge them but then more vines attack her from behind, which she fortunately dodges too. The lady tells her that she had a good reaction and she has paid special attention to her evasive techniques over the past year, but the lady was surprised when something bloomed on Ziyadao's vines. The lady asked what it was and why there are red peach blossoms blooming there when Ziyadao's vines should have severed, and when she just cultivated her star chart, which means a completion rate of less than 5%. The lady then notices that Ziyadao's vines are like rootless trees, so flowers shouldn't be able to bloom. The lady then tilts her head back in time to avoid the sharp petals of the flower, realizing that those are blood peach blossoms, nourished by Ziyadao's blood. She then continuously attacks the lady with her blood flowers and sharp petals, making the lady shoutingly ask her if she is crazy and if she thinks she has infinite blood. The lady also shouted at her that she'd drain herself dry, but she just shakily replied that her brother was right and that since flying first isn't viable, she'd stake her life on it. On the other hand, the captain of the wind and sand team, who was facing Ji Yu and Zinkun, asked him why he hid behind a woman now when he could defeat Chen Zia and if he defeated Chen Zia by a stroke of luck. The man then tells him not to hide away when he is giving him a chance to be a man while thinking that their main goal is victory and their plan is to attract Zinkun's attention, letting number four ambush from behind. He raises his fingers while asking the man how he has the nerve to say that and tells the man that whoever wants to be righteous can act, but he doesn't want to. Then, his kidney ringer star sword attacked the lady from behind, making the lady shocked and forcing her to jump away to dodge it. Meanwhile, the man wondered how it was possible and if Zinkan really disarmed his ambush without even looking. The man thinks that Zinkan's skill is unbelievably seasoned and wonders if Zinkan is really a freshman, and if he was not a sheltered flower in the nine-year compulsory greenhouse before it. The man knows that Zinkan says the one who needs practice isn't him, but he also knows that there exists no such flower and Zinkan seems more familiar with combat than any of them, making him wonder what kind of monster Zinkan is. The man then notices that while they were struggling their hardest for the supernova position, Zinkan casually seemed to be using that competition to train his team members. The man was irritated, thinking that Zinkan was just a freshman and he had never heard of him before, yet Zinkan was aiming higher than the goals set for their third year. He then tells Ji Yu that they should activate the star chart, making the man wonder what he means by it, knowing that no star charts need an activation. But then, the man realizes that there is one star chart requiring activation, and it is the one theoretically perfect because there is only one foreign water attribute transcender with a 94% transcended gene rate who successfully cultivated it in that world, and it's said that once activated successfully, it forms its own realm that was completely unreasonable. 
The man then remembers that Jiyu has a 95% transcendent gene, which is the highest recorded in human history, which means she is also capable of cultivating that true star chart. While Zinkun jumps back from Jiyu, Jiyu then said star chart and activated the magnetic star. The strong electricity then exploded around her, making the man, Jia Sheng, Liu Yi, the lady, Zia Dao, Slaughter Rabbit, and Shizai's team look back in shock and saw Jiyu completing the rate of star chart, magnetic star. The man remarked that it appeared to be just an automatic lightning circle that destroys foreign objects. A simple barrier, really. But the fact that a newly reigned star chart could have such an effect was truly enviable. The lady, coming from behind, told Jiyu that, either way, she was just a first-year student and a newly promoted three-star transcender nonetheless. She then activated her 44% Icebird star chart and attacked Jiyu with her feather needle. But the lady was surprised, knowing that with that kind of passive defense, even if it could destroy a cluster of feather needles, Jiyu couldn't withstand countless clusters of them even if she managed to block it all. The lady then gathered her power, asking how Jiyu would respond and created a huge ice structure called an ice cicada above her. But Jiyu simply dissolved the ice easily with her lightning, making the lady incredulous, asking in panic how much electricity Jiyu had stored within herself. The lady then slammed the ground while shouting that Jiyu had only been cultivating for a few days, questioning how Jiyu's transcendent gene could contain such energy, and if that was the difference between a 95 percenter and the rest of them. Jiyu then seriously called Zinkun and told him to help her because she was stuck, but she accidentally slipped, and a powerful electric charge was thrown at him, which he fortunately dodged. She then said she leaked. He stutteringly told her that she should keep learning to control the magnetic star properly and jump away from her a bit more, shouting that she should familiarize herself with it and take those two people next to her as opponents and defeat their captain while she was at it, because that team took the six rewards that belonged to them by defeating the team captains. She simply agreed. She then faced the two members of the sand and wind team. The lady asked the man how they could break through Jiyu's defense, but the man replied that they wouldn't, and they earn rewards by defeating captains, so they should ignore the genetically aggressive junior and stick to the plan to take Zinkun down, making him surprised. The lady then flew toward him with her ice wings while shouting to their member to eliminate Zinkun as quickly as possible, and the man ran toward him too but he just calmly told them that if they chose him, they would be eliminated even earlier. The man raised his hand, telling Zinkun that many newly enrolled junior brothers had uttered the same bravado. Placing his hand on the ground, he declared that Zinkun wouldn't end any differently. He then attacked with flying sand, and the lady complimented this with her feather needle, while the man shouted that Zinkun, having attended only a few classes, should allow his senior to teach him a lesson. He emphasized that even when a lion hunts a rabbit, it must exert full effort, but he wouldn't give Zinkun any chance to escape. The man advised Zinkun to adopt a more low-key attitude in the future. However, he was taken aback when Zinkun's hand emerged from the flying sand. The man questioned if Zinkun had dodged all the feather needles and if he could accurately assess direction even amidst the chaos. Zinkun, gripping the man's face tightly, retorted, questioning if the man disliked his triggering of fighting skills. He advised the man that they shouldn't be eliminated so quickly because they still had roles as sparring partners, before throwing the man away. The thrown man cursed in anger, questioning the nature of Zinkun's power and how such a thing could happen. Despite slamming hard onto the ground, he managed to stand up propelled by the force of Zinkun's throw, and continued cursing as Jiyu approached, leaving the man stuttering in bewilderment at the kind of freshmen they were. Meanwhile, in the screening room, a professor exclaimed that there was a problem with Zinkun, as his performance was not typical of a first year, especially with transcended genes at only 1%. He suggested a thorough background check on Zinkun, including an investigation into his transcended genes. However, Bo Liang called out to Professor Lei Yan, questioning why they should heed his suggestion when Dean King hadn't expressed any concerns. Bo Liang further questioned if Lei Yan wished to consult Vice Dean Fan, given their close relationship, rendering Lei Yan silent and leaving him to merely stare at Bo Liang. Suddenly, all their cell phones rang with a message alerting them that monsters were flooding into King Chu City. A yellow monster alert was activated, and all exterminators ranked peak three stars and above were called to report for relief. Bo Liang then urgently shouted to every professor that they should depart, which they promptly followed. In the dean's office, the secretary inquired of King about the fate of the supernova selection, questioning whether it should be concluded early. King responded that the headquarters had decreed the competition continue despite a few unforeseen events, affirming that the situation remained manageable. He reassured his secretary that deploying their three-star peak exterminators had been a sufficient measure, and the remaining forces would adequately support the continuation of the competition as planned. 
King further elaborated to the secretary that the primary goal of the supernova selection was to facilitate the student's progression, emphasizing that students should not shy away from challenges. He highlighted the importance of preparing for real disasters, where their involvement on the battlefield would be indispensable. At the site, exterminator Song Yin inquired about the current status. Another individual gestured towards the tunnel, explaining that their four strongest transcenders from Nan Yu had managed to corner the invincible monsters within it. However, he relayed that unexpectedly, high-level monsters had emerged in large numbers to attempt a rescue of the trapped monsters, prompting the activation of the yellow monster alert. Consequently, all three star peak transcenders in King Chu City were being mobilized to the scene. Song Yin expressed frustration that not having achieved four stars sooner prevented his participation in the action. He questioned the man about the number of invisible monsters present. The man, somewhat nervously, mentioned three, but Song Yin, confident in his recent breakthrough to four stars, corrected that he sensed at least three, possibly four. Charging into the tunnel, Song Yin alerted everyone to exercise caution, theorizing that the higher level monsters outside might have been summoned by the invisible monster. Yet, he found himself perplexed upon detecting only one monster remaining inside. Midway, he reached out to Shang Guan Kui, expressing disbelief that they had managed to defeat three invisible monsters, thereby affirming their status among the top four strongest in Nan Yu. Shang Guan Kui, however, questioned his hearing, revealing that they had only encountered one invisible monster from the start, and the others had vanished upon their entry. This revelation stunned Song Yin, leaving him to ponder the true intentions of the monsters that had disappeared without a trace, especially since one had not even appeared at all. Suddenly, from deeper within the tunnel, someone called out to Guan Kui, urging her to hurry and assist because they needed to neutralize that one monster while the others were absent. Despite its ability to turn invisible and its toughness comparable to an earth dragon, it lacked regenerative capabilities, offering them a viable opportunity for defeat. Guan Kui instructed Song Yin to utilize his powers to locate the remaining three monsters to avoid any potential ambushes. He assured her he was on it, activating his Heavenly Lake Star Chart and employing his elemental life skill. He commanded it to disperse and listen to the surroundings, through which he discerned Guan Kui, and the others were engaged in intense combat. The area was being inundated by second and third stage monsters, among them beasts transformed into monsters of indeterminate ranks. However, he also learned that the support forces had just arrived. Focusing his efforts on finding the hiding place of the remaining three invisible monsters, he closed his eyes tightly. But, upon hearing nothing that indicated their presence, he opened his eyes in surprise, questioning how this could be and vocalizing his disbelief that the three invisible monsters were not in the vicinity, leaving him to ponder their possible location. Meanwhile, at the Nanyu Transcendence Institution, Luo Yin unleashed his dragon manifest attack on Jia Sheng. Despite Jia Sheng having lost a considerable amount of blood and sustaining numerous attacks, Luo Yin was frustrated by Jia Sheng's incredible resilience and his refusal to lose consciousness. Luo Yin conceded that defeating Jia Sheng was only a matter of time, yet he was perplexed to see Jia Sheng's genes strengthening amidst the battle. Both of them, recognized as low-level transcenders with minimal transcended genes, marveled at the rapid progression of the siblings, speculating whether they would soon exceed them if such growth continued. On another front, the lady and the man assaulted Ji Yu with their sand and ice powers. Even after half an hour, the battle persisted, leading them to question if Ji Yu possessed an endless energy reservoir, likening her to a power plant. Ji Yu, raising and then lowering her hands together, revealed she had deduced the nature of the magnetic field. The lady, alarmed, called out to her captain, while the man reminded her that they were confronting a freshman, implying she should not fear. Ji Yu extended her electromagnet, gathering initial speed in her palm, and activated her acceleration while intently staring at them. She then advanced toward them at high speed using her low-altitude flight. The man, shocked, questioned if she was akin to a cannonball. Just as she appeared above the man, ready to unleash her electricity, she found herself abruptly drained of power and fell to the ground. Despite feeling that she still possessed plenty of electricity internally, it was only sufficient to sustain the magnetic star, and she was now unable to release it externally. The man, seeing her downfall, grinned and declared it was their turn. However, someone rushed at the man and struck him in the neck from behind, stating their time was up. The man was incredulous that Zinkan had ambushed him and collapsed. Even as he argued that despite being honorable, he still couldn't defeat him. Slaughter Rabbit exclaimed over the surprising turn of events and announced that Captain Chu Shaw of Team Wind and Sand had been defeated, and Team Doomsday Starlight had unexpectedly emerged as a dark horse in the supernova selection. She also revealed they were now one of the six teams remaining on the battlefield and declared the first phase of the supernova selection concluded. The man's friend, mocking the man's earlier disparagement of Jia Sheng, suggested a one-on-one -on -one challenge, but the man quickly backtracked, suggesting they had misheard him. 
he implored Wyan to intercede on his behalf with Jia Sheng, promising to offer his bottle of life essence fluid in the future, though Wyan remained silent. Back in the forest, Shizai was engulfed in anger towards Zinkun while utilizing his flames. Slaughter Rabbit announced the commencement of the second phase, emphasizing that the supernova selection would crown only one team as victors. She highlighted the importance of not just strength, but wisdom and luck, revealing that the reward was hidden somewhere within the arena. She added that teams could also obtain clues by defeating other exterminators. Jiyu, acknowledging their need to secure the first place reward for the artificial transcendent enhancement armor, lamented her complete depletion of electricity which would naturally replenish in a day. She mentioned the possibility of absorbing city-wide electricity but noted the refinement process for the new electricity would delay the restart of the magnetic star by at least two hours. Jie Sheng and Ziyada then appeared, battered and bruised. He reassured her that there was no need for drastic measures and that they should take Jie Sheng and the others to rest, declaring their part in the battle over and vowing to take over from there. Meanwhile, Shizai considered the match effectively over for him with the transition to the second phase. When a member inquired if he planned to act alone, he confirmed, suggesting they split up to gather clues while he tried his luck alone. Once isolated, Shizai concentrated on his hearing and used voice transmission. Then he picked up someone disclosing the location of the final reward. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video, comment part 6 in the comments section. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.